We are at lecture 30 today. Um, probably makes pretty good sense because this course, when it's all said and done, will be somewhere in the low 60s as far as uh, lectures or DVD type lessons. So we are, I think, exactly at the halfway point of the semester with spring break pending. So if we look a little sparse today in the classroom, uh, I guess they just didn't read their information properly and they thought that spring break started this morning but it actually starts this evening at the end of all the classes. So I'm sure that they would have been here, but it's a clarification error. Um, so we will uh, kind of finish up 7.7 .7 today, I think. Um, it's a battle to get this complex roots situation covered because some of the ammunition we need, we haven't had yet. So we have to kind of jump ahead and pick a couple of things out of Chapter 8 and use them. There's a chance you've used them before in another math or math-related class, um, but I want to take a look at them, kind of validate that they do, in fact, work, and then use them in this particular case. So here's where we are in terms of the cases that we've covered. We didn't really handle it this way, but if the value under the discriminant is positive, the square root of b squared minus 4ac, you actually get two distinct real roots. So they're real and distinct. So we know what the solution looks like. It looks something like this. We've handled that. We've done examples with that. We've even done a boundary condition problem with that. So that's the first case. Get the characteristic equation, get the roots, go directly to the solution, and then find the c values if, in fact, we have additional information. Case two is where the value under the discriminant is zero, so you don't get two roots, you get a double root. And so the common value for R1 and R2, it is the same. So we kind of upgrade the solution a little bit, and we validated that something like that has a chance of working because of the nature of the uh, product rule and the terms that you create when you look at the product rule. So here's our third case. So we've got a negative value under the discriminant. If we have real coefficients in our characteristic equation, which will always be true for this class, we will have two roots that are complex conjugates of one another. So there's the nature of our two roots that we're going to deal with today. So there's case three. Now, there's some more to that, but it kind of goes, jumps directly to the answer, and uh, that's too big of a leap as far as I'm concerned at this point in time. So we're still in 7.7, .7, which is in the supplement to the text. Uh, we're looking at the third case of second-order linear homogeneous differential equations. So the, when I say complex roots, complex roots to the characteristic equation. So there's the nature of our two roots. We've got a real part and an imaginary part. Uh, you should expect something to be very different from real numbers because these numbers are not real at all and they're very strange when you start dealing with square roots of negative numbers, especially in the exponent position because the solution is going to look something like this. And since they are distinct, we can allow for the two roots in this fashion as opposed to the double root. So look at the ugly thing that's going to occupy R1 and the equally ugly thing that's going to occupy the position of R2. So it turns out that it um, looks like an exponential type function, 
because we've got the base E, but when all is said and done and all the simplification is done, we're going to turn out with a trigonometric result. So that's our goal today is to take this and simplify it in some way, shape, or form. So we'll come back to this, but I, there's a couple things I want us to do that actually kind of raid a couple topics from um, Chapter 8. Get them enough not to get full understanding of them, but just enough to use them so that we can simplify this. So here's a couple things that possibly you've seen before in another math class or math-related class that we now need to use. These are um, Taylor series. Have you dealt with Taylor series before in other math classes or Maclaurin series? Power series that um, express what e to the x is in terms of the th thing that's occupying the x position. So it's 1 plus x plus 1 squared over 2 factorial, x squared over 2 factorial, x cubed over 3 factorial, and so on. And this is an infinite series, but you can see that it would converge if, let's just take an example, let's say we want e to the, I don't know, keep it simple, we could do e to the first, or we could do e squared. Let's do e to the first, and you can see, at least make this series believable. This is how your calculator operates, by the way. Your calculator doesn't know how to do e to the x problems but it converts this to uh, probably a 11th or 13th um, Taylor series, and it computes based on what you're trying to find um, e to a certain power. So if this is true, this is e to the x, then everywhere I see an x, I ought to be able to replace it with a 1. Is that correct? This is a series for e to the x. We now want e to the 1, so x is equal to 1. So 1 plus, here's an x. That'd be a 1. We'd have 1 squared over 2 factorial, 1 cubed over 3 factorial, 1 to the 4th over 4 factorial. Let's get one more. 1 to the 5th over 5 factorial. So it's a really easy series to write out. So if we wanted E cubed, everywhere we put a 1, we'd put a 3. But we know what E is approximately, so it probably makes sense for our first validation to put E to the 1. So I'll put a question mark there since we're trying to validate it. So the 1 plus the 1 is 2. Well, we're on our way. 1 over 2 factorial is 1 half. That's pretty darn close already, right? We're not very far along in the series. 1 over 3 factorial. What's 3 factorial? 1 over, six. 1 over 6. 1 over 4 factorial. 1 over 24. And 1 over 5 factorial. 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. I was about to ask what that meant. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, I didn't see that look on anybody's face that, you know, what in the world's a factorial, but um, got that clarified. So that's 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 120. Is that right? <coughs> Somebody that has their calculator out and working, what's 2 plus a half plus a sixth plus 1 over 24 plus 1 over 120? Of course, to get e to the first, we need to let this thing run indefinitely, right? Let's see how close we are at this point. 2.716. One six. Okay, so we're not there yet. So you can envision the rest of these terms being added in, and this is a, a legitimate power series progression for e to the x. So why do we need that? We have e to some ugly power. We want to be able to write it out almost in polynomial type form. So this is powers of x, x, x squared, x cubed. So it's kind of an infinite termed polynomial, if that makes any sense. We're also going to need, uh, in the simplification, I know it doesn't look a whole lot like simplification yet. It makes it, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. But we're also going to need this same kind of a series expansion for the sine function because we're going to actually end up with the sine of something, and we're also going to end up with the cosine of something. <clears throat> 
one way to remember this is that the sine is an odd function, not like strange or mysterious, odd because the f of negative x is the negative of the f of x. Notice the powers, they're all odd, and notice the factorials, they're all odd. So that's a handy way to remember this. Let's just try something here. Let's try the sine of pi over 6. So if this particular series works for the sine of something, again, this is how your calculator finds the sine of something. It doesn't know the sine function. So if this is the sine of x, everywhere I see an x, I should be re able to replace it with a pi over 6. Now let's say we stop there. We're not very far along in this infinite series, right? We got the first term. Are we reasonably close? What is the sine of pi over 6? That's a fair question for a Friday. One half. One half. What is the number pi divided by 6? <coughs> Somebody take the number pi and divide it by 6. What's around? Point five two three six. Yeah. Three six. Yeah. We're doing pretty well already, aren't we? <coughs> this is a half, and we're at point five two three six. Here's how these things plot along, which we'll explore these in depth in chapter eight. We've got too much, right? We need a half. We've got point five two three six. So we're going to subtract some away. We're going to subtract, in this case, pi over six cubed over three factorial. Guess what's going to happen? We're going to subtract away too much. So what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to add some back in. What's going to happen? We're going to add too much back in. What's the next term? It's subtracted. Oh, we subtract too much. So that's how it goes. It kind of converges eventually on this value, 0.5. So let's get a, a couple of terms here and see what we get. <coughs> Let's do these and see how close we come to the value of <coughs> 1 half, which is what the sine of pi over 6 is supposed to be. So what's pi over 6? The quantity cubed all over 3 factorial. Anybody? 0.02. Three, nine. Didn't we subtract away a little too much? Right? We needed to subtract out 0 0.0236. But aren't we getting closer to a half, which is what we're supposed to get closer to? Now we're under 1 half. We have to add something back in. What's pi over 6 raised to the fifth power divided by 5 factorial? It's not going to be very large. Three point two eight times ten to the negative fourth. Negative fourth. So three zeros. Mm -hmm. Three, three two, eight. two eight. So if we were to add these up, knowing that we're not even close to the entire <coughs> infinite series, but we've picked off the first three terms, that's pretty close, right? To the value of one half. This thing minus point oh two three nine and add this back in. What is it? Point Five zero 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 two eight. Is that right? One five zero 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 two one three. Okay, pretty close to one half. So if we kept going, we'd get each term we add in and subtract, add and subtract. We get closer and closer and closer to this value that we know is the sine of pi over six. Doesn't prove it, by the way. We're not proving these, but we're at least seeing if they're plausible, see if they're believable. So it seems to get us what we need to get for the sine of pi over 6. I don't know that we need to take our time to do the cosine as well because it works just the same way. Um, the more terms you pick off, the closer you get to the actual value that you want. Notice cosine is, this is an odd function. We've got odd powers and odd factorials. Cosine is an even function, right? because the f of x is equal to the f of negative x, which makes it even. All the powers are even. All the factorials are even. So that's, those are handy um, 
memory devices to remember the power series. You don't have to remember them now. That go along with sine and cosine. <clears throat> All right, let's use this one first. We've got e to a power, so we want to um, go back to our complex solutions to our characteristic equation, and then eventually we're going to use all three of these, but let's use this one first. So our solution at this point, just plugging in R1 By the way, if you just plug in the complex roots, then you don't really have the answer because you don't have the function, what it really looks like. So this is why we have to do what we're doing here. Since I've got a sum, I could distribute the x, so x times the alpha and x times the beta times i. Then I could take what is a sum in the exponent position and kind of work backward algebraically into a product. Is that correct? Is that equivalent to the one that's above it? We've done that enough. I don't think I need to break that up into a separate step. Same thing here. I could distribute the x, x times the alpha that's here, and x times the negative beta times i. So that's going to be e to the alpha x times e to the negative i times beta x. Anything gained by doing that right there? You can combine some of the... Okay. E what, what do both terms have? We've got two things added together. Do they both have something? E to the... They both have e to the alpha x. Right? So by taking that sum in the exponent position, translating it backward algebraically to the product of two things with like bases, we're able to now, not that it's anything major, but it's ugly enough, so let's try to farm some of that stuff out in front if we can. I'm going to call this i times negative beta x. Is that okay? Negative i beta x. <coughs> so here's what we, off to the side, we have to get something that's going to substitute for i times something. In this case, that something is beta x. Um, we'll pick the problem up back here when we get what we need to simplify this. So let's say we have something e to the i theta, just so we don't have a beta and an x there yet. So we have something occupying that position. According to our power series for e to the x, whatever is occupying that position where x is, we can put it here, put it here, and put it wherever x is in that infinite um, series, that infinite power series. So for e to the i theta, it ought to be 1 plus, now normally it's x, so now it's going to be i theta. Then it's normally x squared over 2 factorial, so it's going to be i theta squared over 2 factorial. i theta cubed over 3 factorial. So we're using that e to the x expansion. Everywhere there's an x, we're putting in a, an i theta. Let's get one more. This, by the way, is in the supplement. They kind of make the leap to, 
here's what e to the i theta is, but it was my guess, and I think it's true, that we, we don't have all the background that's necessary for this, so we're trying to fill in a little bit of the gaps here. So we're going to square the i. What do you get when you square i? Negative 1. So it's going to be negative theta squared over 2 factorial. Next term, what do you get when you take i and cube it? What's i cubed? Negative i. And i to the fourth, what's i to the fourth? Is 1. Then things are going to start to repeat, right? Because then we're going to have an i to the fifth, and i to the fifth is back to i, right? <coughs> so am I being redundant here? Is this something you've done? in another math class or math related. You've done this? Anybody you've done it? Okay. But it looks like several of you have it done this. So I don't I don't like mystery formulas to all of a sudden appear. So let's just a couple steps and we'll be able to validate this. The grouping that's going to happen from this point forward is we have some terms that have I in them. Every other term will have an I in it. Is that correct? And then we have terms that don't have an I in them. So let's group together the terms that don't have i in them. So there's 1, actually it is 1, minus theta squared over 2 factorial plus theta to the fourth over 4 factorial. Is that enough of a pattern to know what the next term is going to be and what its SIGN is going to be? Next term, although we don't have it, would be what? Negative. Negative. Theta to the sixth over six factorial, and so on, right? We're going to have a bunch of those. Every term that I've underlined has an i in it, so let's factor the i out in front. And if we do that, we get a theta. Then we get a theta cubed, sorry, a minus theta cubed over three factorial. We don't have the next term. Is that enough to figure out what the pattern is and what the next term would be? Plus the it's going to be plus theta to the fifth over 5 factorial. The next term is going to be minus, and it would go on forever. Now, we need to, does that look familiar at all to something I had up here five minutes ago? Uh, 1 minus something squared over 2 factorial sine. plus something to the 4th over 4 factorial. Cosine. Is that cosine? Here's, here's what I had up here a while ago. Does that look like what we have? The terms, <coughs> excuse me, that did not have an I? 1 minus something squared over 2 factorial plus something to the 4th over 4 factorial. Isn't that exactly what we have? So this thing we can call the cosine of theta, right? Because on the green paper it was cosine of x. The variable was an x in the expansion. So that's a cosine of theta. How about this thing that is multiplied by i? Does that look familiar? That should be our sine Taylor series expansion or power series expansion. Sine of x is x minus x cubed over 3 factorial, x to the fifth over 5 factorial, and so on. We don't have x's, we have thetas. So theta minus theta cubed over 3 factorial, that should be sine of theta. Is that okay? So those are the three things that we haven't really had in this book yet that, that we need to make that leap. So that's what e to the i theta is, we have e to the i something else. So everywhere we see a theta, we're going to have to put in a beta x. And over here, every time we see a theta, we're going to have to put in a negative beta x. 
So here's where we are. I'll put the beta x in parentheses. And we are going to use that, that we just kind of developed in a, in a way. So e to the i beta x, I want to put a beta x everywhere there's a, a theta, so that's going to be what? Cosine, instead of cosine theta, it's going to be cosine beta x plus i sine beta x. I know you don't think it's getting better, but it, it is getting a little bit better because we'll get, be able to consolidate some terms. So we made a substitution for e to the i beta x, and we plug beta x in here and here. That's what we've done. We need to do a similar thing over here. We've got i times something. What's the something? It's negative beta x. So where there's a theta in this expansion, we need to put in a negative beta x. Let's see, another parenthesis. So it's probably a good thing we were able to get e to the alpha x out in front because it's already a mess in there. We don't need to make it any messier. Let's see if we can distribute and combine like terms all in one step. So we're going to have a C1 that gets sent to both of these. We're going to have a C2 that gets sent to both of these. Uh, we need to do one more thing before we do that. Cosine beta x and cosine negative beta x, are they the same thing? Is the cosine of something exactly the same as the cosine of yeah. the negative of that. Yes. That's true, right, because it's an even function. So because cosine is even, cosine beta x and cosine negative beta x are the same. If they're the same, I'm going to get rid of this and just call it cosine of beta x. Is the sine of beta x, is it the same thing as the sine of negative beta x? It's the negative of it. Why? Because the sine is an odd function, right? So sine of negative beta x is the same thing as negative sine of beta x. So we'll get rid of that. So now everything is in terms of beta x. So we're going to have a, and you're not responsible for this, reproducing this development. Isn't that nice news today? That's the best news yet. <laughs> that, now it gets a little emotion out of you. Um, so C1 is going to be distributed to this, and C2 is going to be distributed to this. So don't we have C1 plus C2 cosine beta x? Is that correct? C1 is going to be sent to this. C2 is going to be sent to that. So if we factor out cosine beta x, we'd have C1 plus C2. Well, these are constants, so the sum of two constants is just another constant. So we'll be able to simplify that. Uh, C1 is going to also be sent to this, and C2 is also going to be sent to this. So we've got some sine of beta x's. And here we've got negative, which let's associate that with the C2. So we've got some more sine of beta x's. How many sine of beta x's do we have? C1 
minus C2. That's how many sine of beta x's we're going to have. And that takes care of everything, doesn't it? Didn't we use all the terms? C1 that got sent to both of these terms, C2 that got sent to both of these terms. This is not much of a stretch at all to say that some arbitrary constant added to another arbitrary constant is a constant. So we'll call that K1. This is a little bit of a stretch. So we have to allow for our constants in this particular problem. I'm sorry, I forgot something, didn't I? This, ha this had an I, and this had an I, right? So there should be an I here in that second term. So if we take C1 minus C2, that's not a stretch. That's a constant. But that constant is multiplied by I. If we allow for our k values to be non-real numbers, then we can go ahead and say for C1 minus C2 times I, we're going to call that K2. We're just opening it up and saying it's not just some normal number. It might, in fact, be complex. So we have taken a solution that looked very exponential because we started with e to some ugly power and e to some other ugly power, and we've converted that into something that's very trigonometric. And you'll see when we get to applied problems why we want a solution that is oscillatory, which this is an oscillatory function uh, that can be affected by this coefficient out in front because something is going to have a, a path or a description of its motion that is oscillating. So we want the model to match what the motion is actually going to look like. So if we have two complex roots, that are in the form of alpha plus beta i and alpha minus beta i, there is what our solution is going to look like. The problems are going to be very easy now that we've done this battle. We've identified what alpha is. It's very clearly identified in the solution. We've identified what we do with beta. Once we identify beta, beta is very clearly identified in our solution. So back to this sheet, and let me unfold what the author says our solution should look like in case three. So if there's a root alpha plus beta times i and alpha minus beta times i, here's what our solution is going to look like. e to the alpha x, we got that, right? They have c1, we had k1, same kind of deal. Cosine beta x plus c2 sine beta x. So it is the sum of sines and cosines. And you'll see that we're going to need an oscillatory model, and this is exactly what we want in the third case. So let's do our first example of this type. And then we'll add some boundary conditions, time permitting, which I think we're going to have time to do this all the way through. Uh, let's go from the second order linear homogeneous equation to the characteristic equation. That skips a couple steps. What is the characteristic equation that goes along with this? R squared minus 10i plus 41. That 41 is not looking too good, is it? We're not liking the 41. But let's see what happens. Probably not going to factor. I think we can concede that fact because the 41 is kind of stubborn. So let's see what the quadratic formula is going to yield. We know what it's going to yield because it's an example of this type, so it's going to have a negative under the radical. It's not going to be a surprise. Let's just validate it. Negative b plus or minus 
b squared minus 4 times a is 1 times c is 41 all over twice a. So we've got 100. 4 times 1 times 41 is what? 164? So we've got a square root of negative 64. What are we going to call the square root of negative 64? Let's call it Steve. Now, Ed. Ed. Let's call it Ed. Now, what would we call it? 8i. 8i would be a better name. <laughs> and the fact that everything is divided by 2, let me tell you what I see occasionally from intelligent young people such as yourselves. Somebody will make a just a radical departure from reality and reduce 10 and the 2. Okay? What's wrong with that? Can I just reduce the 10 and call it a 5 and reduce the 2 and call it a 1? So the answer is 5 plus or minus 8i. I'm not going to write it down because it's not correct. How can I reduce numerator and denominator? It's got to be a factor of the numerator, right? The entire numerator. Don't we have two terms in the numerator? So in order to reduce a 2 in the numerator and the denominator, I've got to have it as a factor, not just one of them. It's got to be a factor of both of them. And now that it's a factor of the numerator and a factor of the denominator, we have our two solutions. I know nobody's going to admit that you have ever, ever actually done that, reduced the 10 and the 2, but I've seen it enough in the 30 plus years I've been teaching mathematics too. I almost believe that it's true, but then reality kicks in and I know it's not true. So we have alpha equals 5. Beta equals, and we are always in our problems going to have complex conjugates of one another because the coefficients of our characteristic equation will be real, and that guarantees this kind of solution. Beta is 4. You could say beta is 4 or negative 4. It's not going to affect the solution, so let's choose the easier of the two. So there's what our solution is supposed to look like in this particular category. So we know what to sub in, alpha and beta, e to the 5x. So since we've done the battle and come up with this, it makes the getting from our solutions, complex solutions to the characteristic equation, getting to a final solution, a pretty easy process. Now, there is some memorization, so you're probably going to have to memorize this. But it's worth memorizing as opposed to trying to develop it. I think we'd get 100% agreement on that. Some things, it's not that big a deal. You know, if you don't remember, is it 1 plus tangent squared that's secant squared? Not that big of a deal because you can take sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, and 12 seconds later you can have the tangent squared secant squared identity. But I think it took more than 12 seconds to develop this, so that's probably one you want to remember. Um, let's add to this problem some initial conditions or some boundary conditions. Let's say that we also know, or we want y of 0 to be 1, and the y of pi to be 2. So you know what's going to result from this. We're going to be able to solve, more than likely, for k1 and k2. So we'll have a solution as opposed to a family of solutions. So y of 0 equals 1. So x equals 0, y equals 1, right? 
So 1 equals e to the 5, 0. I never did address the tests. I didn't have any grading time yesterday. I am taking over a class for a teacher who's going on family medical leave. Um, so I kind of was bringing myself up to speed to take over that class for her. So I'll be doing that the rest of the semester. So no grading time yesterday. I apologize for that. I do want to grade them all before I decide what to do anyway as far as just scaling it by a certain amount of points or throwing out everybody's worst problem. So I knew I wasn't going to have them all graded. So e to the 5, 0 is e to the 0, which is 1. Cosine of 4 times 0, that's the cosine of 0, which is 1. And sine of 4 times 0 is sine of 0, which is 0. Let me go ahead and e to the 5, 0 is e to the 0, which is 1. So we end up with a solution. K1 is 1. So we also know that y of pi equals 2. So when x is pi, y is 2. K1, we already know, so I just put a 1 in there. Um, not good. That's what I was thinking about when I was writing down the other one. I'm not liking the way the second piece of this is going to work out. What happens? Why is it not good? K2 goes to the front. It's multiplied by 0. Yeah. Okay. We've got sine of 4 pi, which is 0, so we lose our K2, so we don't know what our K2 is, right? <laughs> so I've got flawed data here. Let me see if I can find the, where I got this. Maybe I got it from the list of problems at the end. Maybe I can make the correction. I'm not seeing it here in this list of problems. But we're not going to get a solution with this, right? I've got y of pi. Hmm. Well, I wrote that down wrong. Maybe it's y prime of pi is equal to 2. Let me see what that would, that would correct things. Yeah, I'll, I'll get it corrected, and we'll look at the boundary value problem. But that's not going to get us. That needs to change to something else, because we lose our K2, and that's what we're looking for out of this equation. So something happened. I wrote down the wrong conditions. All right, I'll get that corrected, and we'll look at that at another time. We have one more boundary condition problem to look at. And then we'll be right where we need to be um, in this section. So let's suppose we had this problem. That bothers me that I wrote that down like that. That's not good. This doesn't necessarily have to fit in the same category we just finished. It could fit in any category since we're now done with all three cases. So the characteristic equation is 
Can you go through the mechanism for that, or is that, did it, was that yesterday? Say that again, please. Can you go through the mechanism for that? The, for how we get from here to here? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me get this part done. We'll get our two R values, and then I'll kind of go backward. Um, <coughs> that's right. You weren't here. If, that, if that's the case, then don't worry about it. Yeah, but, but I, it's okay to revisit that, but I'm going to go a little quicker since. It's going to be R squared. Okay. R squared. Thank you. That's what she said, but I didn't write that down. So we've got a plus four and a plus four. Isn't that what you said? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, at this point in time in this class today, I probably trust you more than I trust myself with uh, value since I've got some flawed conditions in that one problem. So we have a double root, OK? Uh, Jacob wanted to know where, how we get from here to here. So this is going to be quick. But we know that something, some original function plus its derivative times a number, plus its second derivative, possibly times a number. A function that has a chance of working there is the exponential function. And we could have a C in front of it, but I'll forego that just to make this a little bit simpler. So since this is the nature of what Y might eventually be, we need to be able to plug in its derivative and its second derivative so that R, and then the next one's going to be R squared, right. the second one. Okay. okay, good. And then you can factor out an e to the Rx, which is never equal to zero. Therefore, this is the only realistic part that has a chance of being zero. All right, double root. So let's jump to the solution. This is case two. When we have a double root, what does the solution look like? C2x okay. Does that work? We will see similar um, situations when we have to kind of keep going with this philosophy of adding an x till we get a solution that actually works. Hopefully, my data here is good. Um, so let's see y is 2 and y prime is 1. I bet you that's where my mistake was on the other problem. So here's some initial conditions or boundary conditions. So when x is 0, y is 2. And when x is 0, y prime is 1. So we do need to take the derivative. Unfortunately, it's got a product rule, but it should be fairly quick. So when x is 0, y is 2. So that term is 0. We've got e to the negative 4, 0, which is e to the 0, which is 1. So c1 is 2. y prime. All right, here's our y value, so we need our y prime. What's the derivative of c1e to the negative 4x? 4e to the negative 4. Negative 4. Negative 4. Negative 4. C1. E to the negative 4. Okay, and now we have a product rule. First times derivative of second plus second times derivative of first. And we want, when x is 0, we want y prime to be 1. So y prime is 1. So there's a 0 as a factor, so that term's gone. Negative 4, don't we already know that C1 is 2? So let's plug that in. 
e to the 0 is 1. That whole term is gone. So we've got C2, e to the 0, so that's just C2. So we should be able to solve for C2. So it looks like C2 is <coughs> 9. So our final solution, C1 is 2. C2 is 9. So there's our final answer to that with the given boundary conditions. Have a wonderful spring break. I will see you in a little over a week. have 1 squared over 2 factorial, 1 cubed over 3 factorial, 1 to the 4th over 4 factorial, let's get one more, 1 to the 5th over 5 factorial. So it's a really easy series to write out. So if we wanted E cubed, everywhere we put a 1, we'd put a 3. But we know what E is approximately, so it probably makes sense for our first validation to put E to the 1. So I'll put a question mark there since we're trying to validate it. So the 1 plus the 1 is 2. Well, we're on our way. 1 over 2 factorial is 1 half. That's pretty darn close already, right? We're not very far along in the series. 1 over 3 factorial, what's 3 factorial? 1 over, six. 1 over 6. 1 over 4 factorial. 1 over 24. And 1 over 5 factorial. 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. I was about to ask what that meant. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, I didn't see that look on anybody's face that, you know, what in the world's a factorial, but um, got that clarified. So that's 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 120. Is that right? <coughs> Somebody that has their calculator out and working, what's 2 plus a half plus a sixth plus 1 over 24 plus 1 over 120? Of course, to get e to the first, we need to let this thing run indefinitely, right? Let's see how close we are at this point. 2.716. 1 6. Okay, so we're not there yet. So there's the nature of our two roots. We've got a real part and an imaginary part. Uh, you should expect something to be very different from real numbers because these numbers are not real at all and they're very strange when you start dealing with square roots of negative numbers, especially in the exponent position because the solution is going to look something like this. And since they are distinct, we can allow for the two roots in this fashion as opposed to the double root. So look at the ugly thing that's going to occupy R1 and the equally ugly thing that's going to occupy the position of R2. So it turns out that it um, looks like an exponential type function because we've got the base e, but when all is said and done and all the simplification is done, we're going to turn out with a trigonometric result. So that's our goal today is to take this and simplify it in some way, shape, or form. So we'll come back to this, but I, there's a couple things I want us to do that actually kind of raid a couple topics from uh, chapter. That's the first case. Get the characteristic equation, get the roots, go directly to the solution, and then find the C values if, in fact, we have additional information. Case two is where the value under the discriminant is zero, so you don't get two roots. 
you get a double root. And so the common value for R1 and R2, it is the same. So we kind of upgrade the solution a little bit and we validated that something like that has a chance of working because of the nature of the uh, product rule and the terms that you create when you look at the product rule. So here's our third case. So we've got a negative value under the discriminant. If we have real coefficients in our characteristic equation, which will always be true for this class, we will have two roots that are complex conjugates of one another. So there's the nature of our two roots that we're going to deal with today. So there's case three. Now there's some more to that, but it kind of goes, jumps directly to the answer and uh, that's too big of a leap as far as I'm concerned at this point in time. So we're still in 7.7, .7, which is in the supplement to the text. Uh, we're looking at the third case of second order linear homogeneous differential equations. So the, when I say complex roots, complex roots to the characteristic equation. We are at lecture 30 today. Um, probably makes pretty good sense because this course, when it's all said and done, will be somewhere in the low 60s as far as uh, lectures or DVD type lessons. So we are, I think, exactly at the halfway point of the semester with spring break pending. So if we look a little sparse today in the classroom, uh, I guess they just didn't read their information properly and they thought that spring break started this morning but it actually starts this evening at the end of all the classes. So I'm sure that they would have been here, but it's a clarification error. Um, so we will uh, kind of finish up 7.7 .7 today, I think. Um, it's a battle to get this complex roots situation covered because some of the ammunition we need, we haven't had yet. So we have to kind of jump ahead and pick a couple of things out of Chapter 8 and use them. There's a chance you've used them before in another math or math-related class, um, but I want to take a look at them, kind of validate that they do, in fact, work, and then use them in this particular case. So here's where we are in terms of the cases that we've covered. We didn't really handle it this way, but if the value under the discriminant is positive, the square root of b squared minus 4ac, you actually get two distinct real roots. So they're real and distinct. So we know what the solution looks like. It looks something like this. We've handled that. We've done examples with that. We've even done a boundary condition problem with that. So eight get them enough not to get full understanding of them, but just enough to use them so that we can simplify this. So here's a couple things that possibly you've seen before in another math class or math related class that we now need to use. These are um, Taylor series. Have you dealt with Taylor series before in other math classes or Maclaurin series? Power series that um, express what e to the x is in terms of the th thing that's occupying the x position. So it's 1 plus x plus 1 squared over 2 factorial, x squared over 2 factorial, x cubed over 3 factorial, and so on. And this is an infinite series, but you can see that it would converge if, let's just take an example, let's say we want e to the I don't know, keep it simple, we could do e to the first or we could do e squared. Let's do e to the first and you can see, at least make this series believable. This is how your calculator operates, by the way. Your calculator doesn't know how to do e to the x problems, but it converts this to uh, probably a 11th or 13th um, Taylor series and it computes based on what you're trying to find um, e to a certain power. So if this is true, this is e to the x, 
then everywhere I see an X, I ought to be able to replace it with a 1. Is that correct? This is a series for e to the x. We now want e to the 1, so x is equal to 1. So 1 plus, here's an x, that'd be a 1. 